YouTube channel. On the YouTube channel. So I have cards if you want to grab okay, that address. So, okay. so this is our fourth one, right? So so um, here we go, okay? So um so Dan Dan. Yes, right? yes. So I went I went I went on I went on I went on your website, right? Yes. And if you haven't seen Dan's website, it's amazing, right? Dianrodriguez.com, it's amazing. Because one of the I think things Rodriguez Dash dot com. Dash dot com? No, Diane dash Rodriguez.com. Diane dash Rodriguez.com, <laughs> anyway. right? So I went on the website and because one of the things that I mentioned was she wanna talks about she wants to talk about this very important topic of sustaining a career, right? Mm -hmm. In the arts, right? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us can really relate to how well, let alone starting a career, right? <laughs> That's the first challenge, right? But just sustaining it for the long right. just being in it and which, when I saw your website, you could just see the trajectory, right, of, of, of her career, and it's amazing, right, and it's still going, it's still going. I mean, from 10 years with Teatro Campesino, right, uh, helping found Latin's Anonymous, right. OB award-winning actress, right, uh, award-winning director, <coughs> which I think John Lipazamo and yes. Culture Clash, yes. right, and then associate producer and director of new play development at Center Theater Group. I mean, wow, right, what a career, so. Just that sense of, um, I really got the sense like, this is a person who has had an amazing career. What's that Kaiser commercial, like, don't just live, thrive, whatever. <laughs> so, <laughs> Diane is thriving big time, right? <laughs> Diane is thriving big time. So, so what makes me think, like, my first question is, why is this topic interesting to you of sustaining a career? Why does that um, right. interest you? Well, you know, I, I, uh, I wish that more of us have the opportunity to be able to sustain a career, I think. Um, and how, how do you do it is, is the big question. I was on a panel last week uh, for a very big foundation and, you know, I'm usually great about putting certain hats <coughs> on where uh, I'll be in a, in a room and it's about great artists and I'll take my, sometimes my diversity head off hat off and I'll put my great art hat on and I'm like, you know, I'm just going to look at the work. But at a certain point, 
you do that a lot and then you're like, wait a minute here, this is not feeling good. There aren't enough of us, people of color, Latinos, who, are at, uh, who have had the opportunity to grow and get to the national level and be awarded some of these major grants that are, you know, $250,000 to an individual artist or, you know, a MacArthur or, you know, even a MAP grant. I mean, where, and where are we in this arena? And so, to me, the very important topic is a sustaining career, but, you know, how to build a career how to uh, enter the arena of even having a career, uh, I think is a really important, uh, um, you know, subject to me because not all, all of us, enough of us talk about it and have access to it. And that's a really important, I think, issue. One of the things that I think is super important is, is being as excellent as you, you can be. And, and that word, sometimes, I think excellent can be very fascistic. Do you know, like, I work at a theater where people are like, well, the word has to be excellent. And you're like, well, what's your definition of excellent, really? I mean, you know, because sometimes excellent might be defined in certain cultural terms, you know, and I don't really uh, agree with that. But what does it mean to be really good at what you do and be competitive? And I know a lot of people think competitive is not a good word, but to me I think competitive is a really important word. How can you be competitive in your field in whatever you do? Whether it's being a playwright, a performance artist, a solo performer, a director, you know, a manager, an actress. You know, how can we be the best that we can be and get out there and compete? You know? And, um, and the other is, how do we um, be, how are we well-rounded artists? Because all of us know, when I was an actor, I wasn't, I wasn't acting 24-7. I mean, there were moments when there were long, dry spells, and you're collecting unemployment, and you're like, oh my god, I'm never going to act again. And you're like trying to figure out what to do, and there were times when I was designing costumes at San Diego Rep, and acting. Or, uh, or I was, you know, uh, you know, directing and acting, or I would have a writing gig, and I, I would do many things. And one of the things that I was really inspired with in Teatro Campesino, and that I've always taken with me uh, throughout my career, is this idea of being a spherical artist, which is an artist that is very well-rounded, that's able to roll with the punches. And I love that, being able to roll. When you're an actor, you know how to roll. You know, you, you know, you, you role play. You're you you're rounded. You if somebody throws you a ball and you, you know how to catch it and and you can turn around and throw it back. You're in the moment, and that's the way. When when you're acting on stage, you're very much in the moment. Uh, you're very present, and that's I believe the way that you have to be with your career. That things come your way, and you have to know how. To, and it may be a failure. Things might you may fail, and you have to know how to. Come on in, come on in. <laughs> and you have to know how to take that failure and, 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 and make it a positive. Uh, grow with that failure. Um, so uh, I think that that's a really important thing. So to do many things, to be able to do many things that all work together, um, I, I think is a really important thing. I mean, you know, Jose is a playwright. Jose is a classicist. Playwright. Uh, he also is a teacher. He also is, you know, potential being a professor. And so, how do those two things work together? Uh, you know, um, you know, Vivi is a is an actress, uh, but she also is uh, works backstage and caught, you know, and in, 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 um, in crew. You know, now that may feel like, oh, well, wow, she's an actress. Why is she working backstage on crew? Well, you know, she's still in it. She's still very much in it. She meets people, etc. And that's not a bad thing to be able to do both those things. So, I think that those are really important elements of of keeping it going. And then once you're in it for many many years and you get in the groove, certain things I think begin to pop, and then you begin to have a little bit more consistency in what you do. But I, I do think that that's sort of the overall. That's what I was going to ask you, like, because 
how conscious were you of that? Like, let's say when you're with Teatro Campesino, you know, you started when you were 18. Mm -hmm. So, how, were you conscious of some of these things? No. Or were you green, green, like, you no, know? No, no. I mean, the first 10 years, I was, you know, just sort of figuring it all out. I was not a very good actress, you know. I had a very small voice. I was a big girl that was trying to be very small, you know, very uh, tiny, you know, very, uh, yeah, petite, and I wasn't. So, and you're like, girl, get it together. You know? <laughs> Find out who you are. And it was like, it took me about 11 years. The 11 years I was in the theater to figure out, now you're a big girl, you should have a big voice, you know. <laughs> You know, Luis Valdez used to do these things where he would ask you, um, he'd have these like uh, conferences with you, one on one, and he'd want to know, you know, what do you, what do you want? What do you, yeah, what do you want? <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I never quite knew what I wanted, you know, uh, and I always knew he he wasn't quite sure about me, you know, but there was something deep inside me that thought that knew that I was that would stick to something. Even though I couldn't really express it, but I knew that I was going to stick to it. And I think that really surprised him, you know. Uh, so I did listen to a voice inside me that would that knew that I could sustain something. Uh, and even though there were people around me that doubted that, I stuck to it. And I proved them in a way wrong, yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, I think being in the theater was definitely a, 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 it was a you know I built on you know a learn it was a learning curve it really was and then I think by the time I left which was in my late twenties uh, um, I was a better actress you know and I didn't really learn everything there in San Juan San Juan taught me certain th ways of acting you know I could act with a mask. I was, it was a physical, it was a heightened, but I didn't really know how to play scenes. Do you know what I'm saying? I really didn't know uh, how to play objectives, or I didn't really know how Were to... Were you aware of this while you were there? Yeah, leaving, by, the time, like, by the time I was around 27, I was like, oh my God, you know, I don't think I could do a real straight play. You know, I, mm -hmm. I don't know that I could just drop the mask working and the big physicality and just kind of be me. And so I went to San Francisco and I took acting classes with this woman named Jean Shelton. And I worked with her for about two years when I was still in the theater. So I was doing the theater and then when I could, I'd sneak away and, and study with her. And, and that gave me a basis for being sort of just a straight actress. So then I was a little bit more prepared when I came to L.A. to, to then just start auditioning, you know. I was lucky when I came to LA because I had the pedigree of having been into, in the teatro. So there were some people that knew the teatro campesino, and then when I come in, they're like, oh, you work with Luis? And I'm like, yeah. Then I would audition, and then they would cast me based on my prior work with San Juan. So that gave me a little edge in the theater community. My first job ended up being at the very theater that I work at now, which is at the Taper in 1985. I got hired my first time out for two shows at the Taper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what then shows that, they, they were, uh, one was, it was for their school tours, uh, School Talk and Family Album or something, and mm -hmm. it was with this director named Peter Brocious, who now mm -hmm. runs the Minneapolis Children's Theater, and I still, he's still a very good friend. Uh, but in that cast was uh, Jorge Galvan, who used to be in the Teatro uh, Campesino and lives here in L.A., no longer is acting, and a, and a woman named Chloe Webb. Uh, does anyone know who she is? Mm -hmm. Chloe Webb was, I don't know if you ever saw that, that movie, it was a seminal movie about punk called Sid and Nancy. Mm -hmm. It was with Gary Oldman and Chloe Webb played Nancy Spongebob. Mm -hmm. And she and I worked at the Taper in 1985 and that year she auditioned for, I can't remember the director's name, Alex something, direct, and she got it. And uh, she went off and, and did you know, Sid and Nancy and when she came back, Wow, she's a mess. I mean, admittedly, she says this. This is her thing. She, uh, and, and one of the things that was very interesting was that Gary Oldman was trained in the school of, you know, England. I mean, you know, where you don't really think, you just do it. Just act. 
Chloe was trained in the American method, which is, you know, method. <laughs> what is my motivation, you know? And so she would have to do some really painful scene, and Gary Oldman would be smoking a cigarette, and he'd be joking, and she'd be like banging her head on the wall, and then the scene would start, and he would just like flip the and he'd just go and do it, and she would just be all pain. And that months and months of doing that, you know, she really, it really affected her. And, uh, and that was very interesting because I also come from the school of just do it. You know, no psychology uh, from the way that you move, from your motion, you'll get to that emotion. Don't bother me with the psychology of the character. And, and that's kind of, and, I, and it's interesting because the English work that way, and so do the Latin American, a lot of Latin American uh, directors. I'm producing a show at the Douglas by a Latin American director and writer named Guillermo Calderon, and he told me last week, his quote was, don't hire, don't get me actors who bother me with the psychology of the character. Love it. I wanted to say, I forgot to mention, please jump in, okay? Yes, jump in. Any questions and share anything, please. So much. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I love um, what you say about being a spherical artist. Yes. And so often, like in acting workshops, we hear you these days, you've got to know your brand. Focus on your brand. <laughs> like, are you the dramatic actor? Are you the comedic actor? If you have all those other skills, don't even let people know because you've got to focus, you've got to focus. And that may be for like when you're just out of school and you're just trying to build your career. And I'm just curious how you feel about that, like that sort of contradiction really. In it life. is a contradiction and I think, you know, there's a business, that's business. Like if you're, if you're you know, Christina Frias and you uh, want to focus on television work, you know, uh, then I do think it's important to focus, you know, and be realistic about what kinds of roles you're going to play and focus on getting those roles. I mean, really, in the end, uh, you know, you're, you, if you can be typecast, you're going to work the most, mm -hmm. right? So by the time I was 40, I only played women, but as the older I got, the worse my English got. <laughs> on, television. <laughs> on television, and by the time I was 40, I never played anybody that spoke English, right? But I worked all the time. Now, you can either go, wow, I'm working all the time, I'm making my insurance, I'm, I'm getting retirement, or you can go, I am so bored, what else am I, I can't, I have a college degree, I, I'm, you know, it's like, so it, it really depends on where you want to go. Now, you look at all these actresses today, and you look at, um, she just uh, was on the Academy, uh, Le Mis, a uh, gal who won it. Anne Hathaway. Anne Hathaway, well obviously now she's a, on, she started off as an ingenue, but the girl's also a stage actress, mm -hmm. major stage, mm -hmm. she's really good on stage. So, you know, at that point in her career, she can do everything, right? I think stage is a really different thing, really, because in stage, you have a lot more freedom to be able to do what you want to do, and, and, and uh, it's a lot more um, open. You don't have that kind of same boxes that people put you in so that you can work. So mm -hmm. I, I do think, though, if you're really focused, some people should be focused on, I'm gonna, I want to get TV work. This is what I'm strong at. This is the way that I look. And be realistic. I think it's good for you. Yeah, as a business move. Anyone else? Well, I know what I want to ask you. Yes. Then. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about this, like you said, we just asked you, what do you want? Yes. What do you want? That's such an important question. <laughs> yeah, right, like to know. It sometimes is. a lot of that goes on in there too sometimes, right? <laughs> Talking to people. But, um, so this move to associate producing and, and you, like, how was, was that something you wanted to get into producing and, or is that, or does it, that just kind of happen? Like, you know, how does that work? Yeah, it wasn't something I, like, ever, like when I grew up, was like, I want to be a producer. It's never that. I happen to be good at it. But it's like it's like a skill, but it's not something I would rather be a director and a writer and an actor and and not have to worry about producing other people's work. Yeah. I mean, honestly, but uh, it's uh, afforded me great opportunity. It's given me a very big platform. It's really, really been very good for my career nationally. 
you know, I'm on the TCG board. I get, I mean, I really, there are so few of us in the American theater, so few Latina, Latinos or Latinas at this level working in a large institution as a, as a you know, a senior leader uh, that, you know, uh, people need a Latina, a West Coast person, and a woman, you know, you're like the only person. And so <laughs> you, you end up having a lot of opportunity and ask to go to a lot of places. So I appreciate and, and feel very grateful that it was something that I could do. And then I feel that one of the things that I've really grown to embrace is that I can help other, other people. I can open doors for other people. I can give advice to people and give, and, and, and have uh, the dream be accessible because I can advise them on what they should do or what doors they should go through or how they should um, uh, position their their uh, their, um, their uh, project. You know, I, I got an email about can so and so talk to you about their musical? Well, yes, they can talk to me about their musical, but only for me to give them advice. Don't ask me to pitch your musical at my theater mm -hmm. if you don't have a major book writer attached because it's unrealistic and that's mm -hmm. going to be a waste of your time and of my time. Mm -hmm. And I've really, really tried to bring like really cool projects to the table, Los Lobos, Oso Motley, both unattached, uh, both sort of not um, uh, uh, well, professional uh, uh, book writers, and they've both not gone anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I really, it's not, it's not a, it's a waste of their time, it's a waste of my time, and it's a waste of resources. So, yeah, I mean, there are just certain things that, you know, you just, there's just, you're not going to break that mold, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's so, but, uh, but I can help and find and push <coughs> you, you know, so, um, so yeah, I've really enjoyed that. I've enjoyed mentoring people there. You know, I've had quite a few, including Jesus Reyes, where is he? Jesus Reyes. Oh, he's in front of us. Yeah, he's the surprise question before. Oh, okay, right. <laughs> For him. Right, right. And a uh, great guy named Robert Castro. You know, so it's really afforded me, Jacob Padron, you know. It's really afforded me some real opportunity for myself and then for other people. It's it's really, I, I'm very appreciative. And, you know, one of the things, Michael Ritchie, I have to say, you know, he's, he's been, uh, he's given me a lot of freedom, you know, he's, I'm very, uh, he's, he's let me go, you know, he's understood who I am, and, uh, you know, he's, he's let me go into the world, and appreciates what I bring back, which is great. I can't ask for more. And you mentioned, um, the platform, right? Yes. And the opportunity yes. that has you, like, have you always been comfortable with having that platform? Because I know, like, sometimes, um, we, you're Daniel Rodriguez, but to us, you're an artist, but also sometimes yes. a woman who's yes. successful and a Latina woman, right? Sometimes yes. we put those yes. other you know, layers on there. Like, have you always been comfortable with, in a way, like, I know I hate, I hate this example, but it's the only one I could think of. Like, Michael Jordan, right, he was given so much grief because he straight out said, I am nobody's role model. I am, that is not my role here. I'm, I'm a basketball player. Leave me alone, right? right. So how, how are you with having that kind of platform where people see you as kind of our advocate in a way, in a sense? Right. Like, yeah, I don't really feel, I feel like everyone's been really cool. I don't really feel a pressure about mm. that. You know, I think everyone's been cool. I think uh, uh, people have been very supportive. Uh, yeah, I, I, I haven't really felt a, um, maybe because I, I feel like, uh, there's been some level of opening doors, you know, and that people have seen uh, my struggle, you know. Because uh, it has been a, a real struggle. It hasn't been easy at all, you know. Um, because I really didn't have anyone in front of me. You know, uh, I, I started out, you know, in a agitprop theater company, you know. Uh, and, and so I kind of made my own way and I think people recognize that, and uh, yeah, they've been very supportive and cheering me on rather than putting pressure on me to deliver something that they know I can't probably deliver, you know. Uh, even even when uh, we had this huge controversy 
uh, when Michael first arrived at the theater, and, and there was these, you know, developmental labs that were Latino and Asian and, and black, and uh, and you know there was this choice to to let those go, and I ended up being the only people, the only person remaining from that uh, from that generation of artists that worked at the Taper. I never really felt people like you know say anything. I mean, people were like, "Wow, man, how do you feel?" You know. Uh, more than well, you know, what did you do to stay? You know, um, so it, it was, it was, it was good. Yeah, I, I felt, I felt the community support. I, I mean, I like to think that I feel support because I believe all of us need to give back, and I feel like it's been a real sort of circle. You know, you give and 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 you get back, and you give and you get back, and I feel like that's really what what I've uh, uh, been, what's been my mantra. Yeah. And was there ever a time where, like, you, you struggled, right? You said it wasn't yes. it hasn't been easy. Like, did you ever feel, I don't think I could do this anymore, ever, ever in your career? No, the only time I felt that was around 1994, right before I came to the theater, or to, to the Mark Taper Forum, and I felt very lonely. I felt, um, I was, uh, Latin's Anonymous was, was happening and we had been performing, we had been performing for six years and I felt like the others were not as, you know, came out of the whole Chicano generation and I heard I was working with some really cool people, uh, you know, a gal who was a Guatemalan, you know, Colombian dude, a, a guy who didn't call himself Chicano but Mexican American, you know. <laughs> And, um, <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, we, we worked great and we were just so simpatico together, but the politics were not quite in line. So I always felt a little, I don't know, there was something that was a little um, um, uh, wanting, you know. Uh, and although, you know, admittedly, we're still all very good friends. There was a lot of magic in Latin's Anonymous. It was such a fun group, and it was a seminal group. But I, uh, so there was a little period where I decided to leave, and then I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. And I'm a real people person, and I'd be home, and I'm like, why, what am I doing? You know, I, I, it was a loneliness. And at that point, I really needed something. And this job came up with the taper, and they had hired me as a consultant to uh, look at the list of potential people that, to apply for this job. And I looked at the list and I'm like, hmm, why, you know, why is it my name on that list? <laughs> and then I thought, you know, I don't know that I could get this by myself, you know, because people just think, you know, I'm an actor. So I had been performing some solo work and I had been on this, uh, you know, circuit with Luis Alfaro. And so I didn't really know him that well, but you know, I had a good feeling about him. And so I, one day after one of our gigs, I went up to him and I said, hey, you know, there's this job available. You want to be partners and maybe we can go in on it together. And so he's like, yeah, okay. I mean, it was that casual. <laughs> so we're like, okay, so we got the app. I don't even know if it's an application. We just kind of figured out, let's write, let's write a proposal. So we wrote this proposal for this job. And uh, and we went in for the interviews and stuff, you know, and uh, uh, you know we were competing against people who had you know master's degrees and all the deal, and to Yale and all that, and all, you know all, all that you know, and uh, you know we went on a number of things and we and we actually got it. So then, uh, but it was it was only one job and we were proposing to do it. You know, there were two of us. So we said, we'll share a salary. <laughs> and we're like, okay. <laughs> so for one year, we shared a salary. And I think we both made like $19,000 or whatever. And we worked part time. And then after a year, the taper felt too guilty. <laughs> and they increased our salary, and they gave us benefits. We were still part time, and they gave us full time uh, salary, uh, full time benefits, and we, you know, we were there for 10 years as, as directors. So it was kind of like a little out of the box thinking to get this job, and then doing a proposal, you know, uh, and, it, and, it, and it worked in our favor. You know, it was, just, it was different. And, uh, and that's uh, and and that I think is also one of the things that I carry with me is this idea of of big ideas, 
You know, I think to you that it's important for us to be big idea people and to think about ideas that may not be, nor, you know, like are out of the box and to not be afraid to pitch ideas. Um, and and that's, that's my thing. You know, ideas, dime a dozen. I got them. Uh, if you don't like it, I got another one. You know, uh, and I get and I get that from my dad. My dad always had, you know, I have an idea, and we're like, oh my god, it's <laughs> an idea, oh my god. <laughs> and that's, and that, but it is about that. It is about being able to pitch a lot of ideas, and don't take it personal if they don't like it. Here's another one, or let me morph that one, or they have an idea, then morph it. And and I think that that has been a tremendous part of my success is the is the the idea that this notion of being an ideas person um, and and even now at the theater I mean and Jesus has experienced this with me uh, when we shared an office but now even at the theater I think a lot of my job is about thinking about ideas and big ideas that we can get funding for. I mean, I think, you know, our, one of our fund developers today said I'm practically part of the developmental the development department because they, I mean, I think about the ideas that, in fact, can get funded because I have sort of have my pulse on what's happening nationally and what people are interested in doing and what people are interested in getting funded. And that's because I travel a lot because of my job. So, it's good, yeah. Let's open it up here. Hey, okay. Um, Karen, <laughs> and then <laughs> In traveling, what is the most exciting show you've seen the last few times? Yeah, I have. I'm a real fan of a, of a director writer who's an immigrant. Her name is, and she's from Korea. Her name is Young Jean Lee. She's around maybe 37 years old. She lives in New York City. She's from Portland, Oregon. Her parents are Korean. Uh, and they live here in the United States, but they're immigrants. She's barely, she's, I mean, she was born in Korea. This is a woman, an Asian girl, who looks like your typical, you know, what you think is a timid Asian girl. But that girl, oh my gosh, she rocks the boat. She rocks it. She uh, will only do shows that she's afraid of doing. She challenges herself that way. People at the beginning say, oh, you gotta, you gotta talk about, you know, an Asian girl identity. And she's like, I don't wanna talk about Asian girl identity. I wanna talk about black identity. <laughs> Whole play about the black experience. I mean, like, she's Korean. And then, uh, right now, she's writing about white men. That's her latest. Yes. yes you know, about white men identity. And she says it's very, very interesting because the white guys are like, we have a problem. <laughs> we do. <laughs> Let's talk about it. <laughs> I mean, she's just really great, and I think I will. I say this because uh, not all the shows work, but I, I'll, I'll make it a point. I try to fly everywhere to see her work. Mostly, you know, she does it in New York, but she tours a lot. She did this one per, a show that I took a really good friend. It's a very cool woman named Amy Hamilton, who used to work with me at the taper. Very hip, very cool. We go to see Young Jean Lee's play at the kitchen in New York, or, yeah, the kitchen, called The Feminist Project. And it was mm -hmm. seven naked ladies. <laughs> <laughs> we are talking naked. <laughs> <laughs> and they are in every shape and color you can imagine. Uh, and they are prancing about, shaking all over. And it was like, oh my god, and doing some like really you know, near pornographic things and uh, and then moving and being so uh, uninhibited about their bodies and not perfect bodies at all. Uh, and, uh, you know, I found it always it was fascinating. And, you know, of course, I'm there like, oh, God, girl, you're going to cut that. It's too long. But my friend was like, <laughs> I, I mean, really, it gets boring. It gets boring. You know, if there's not enough drama or tension, it gets, you, no matter all these naked people are, you know, it's boring. <laughs> and my girlfriend was, a, she got uncomfortable. And I thought that was so interesting. You know, like, really? You know, she was very uncomfortable. So I love Yang Jin Lee. She's, she's probably one of my favorite artists working right now in, in the country. She's, she's awesome. She's so brave. And she's so, she breaks all stereotypes. And, I just, I just think she's cool. And she's an independent theater artist. 
She does not wait for somebody to produce her own work. She raises the money. She has her company. It's called, it's after her. How audacious to call herself her, the Young Jean Lee Company. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I, she's inspired me. I mean, I've got to be, I'm much older than she is, and I think, wow, I want to write my own plays, and I want to direct my own plays, which I did last year, you know, and she inspired me. And I want to raise my money, and maybe I'll have a Diane Marjorie's company. You know, like, I mean, well, why don't we think like that? Why don't we, young Jean did, why don't we say we want, you know, our own company? Uh, and I think that's very interesting. We have, to, we have to think of ourselves in that way and not be ashamed and not think, oh, people are going to talk about us, you know, that we're egomaniacal. Uh, and um, so, and I, I've learned a lot, a lot from her. The funny thing is that, you know, I'm on this advisory panel for the National Touring uh, Program. Uh, it's out of the New England Foundation for the Arts. It's national, though. And they had, we had awarded her and her company uh, a touring grant. And so uh, we had this meeting two weeks ago in Boston with all the grantees. And uh, I could tell that they, her and her partner, who's their manager, they didn't want to be there. I could tell that they, they were kind of too good for it. You know, you can get the sense that there was like, we, we know what we're doing, and we don't need to be here. And uh, so they matched the advisors with the with the um, the awardees, and I and I happened to get matched with her, and I thought, wow, this is so serendipitous. I I, I, mean, I really, you know, and uh, they knew not, They had no idea why she was, why we'd never brought her out to the West Coast. Why doesn't anyone want to produce me out in California? No one. And she knows I've seen every one of her shows, and I'm like, well, you know, girl, you're too wild. <laughs> but uh, I've been waiting for the right thing, you know. I've been waiting for the right thing, and she's got this thing about white men that I think is going to be cool. It's a play that I think we could possibly do, and so maybe you know maybe we're going to do it. So um, it's cool. But anyway, she's 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 the gal, yeah, for me. Well, I mean, you kind of answered a little, a little bit with, with the story of um, what's trending, uh, what's something that we should be aware of in terms of the national landscape of, of like, you know, the kinds of theater, um, or um, whether it's, it's Latino-based or not, but as Latino artists, we should be aware of it, and we should be, you know, knowing what's going on nationally, That's right. and not just, you know, our own little world here, you know. If but. you guys, if you guys ever have the opportunity to be in New York City in January, early January, usually the second week, like the 8th, 9th, uh, you should all attend Under the Radar Festival in New York City, mm -hmm. because alongside with Under the Radar, there's the Prelude Festival, there's the Coil Festival, it all happens in New York in that week in January. APAP, uh, and it's a really, what that is, that festival is, is it's a festival of independent theater artists, again, who produce their own work, you know, and uh, who raise their own money, who do their own work, and it's very inspiring. Right now there's a big trend nationally of ensembles. They may not be, ensembles who may work with a writer, or are ensembles who create collectively their own work. Or hyper, what I call hyper collaborators, where, say, for example, Jonathan Sinisetos is working with Chris Cool, who's a lighting designer, and they're working with Lisa Tommy, who's a director, and the three of them are creating a piece together. That's what I call hyper collaborative work, and uh, and it's uh, not so much the vision of a playwright, the sole vision of a playwright, but it's the vision of those three collective collaborators. And, and that work is being rewarded quite a lot in the United States right now. And it's taking a little bit of the, surprisingly, a little bit of the steam out of the playwriting driven work, mm -hmm. even though nationally most of the regional theaters uh, continue to um, produce only playwrights, uh, the foundations are giving most of their awards to more uh, 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 independent uh, writers and uh, creators. And I find that very, very interesting because it's very much against the norm. I, I think the regional theaters are falling a little behind. Right now it's those, those ensembles. So I would say uh, under the Radar Festival, if you ever, ever have a chance to go up 
to uh, the, the TBA time-based festival in, uh, in Portland, Oregon at PICA. That's another great festival that happens in the fall. Um, the Philly Live Arts Festival, really great festival if you ever have a chance. There's some great, those, those festivals in particular have really great curators and you can see some really great work all at once, which is kind of what you want to do, you know. Um, there is um, some great nature theater of Oklahoma. It's a great company. Uh, it tours mostly Europe, but sometimes you can see them in New York or it, you know, maybe you'll be able to see it at Red Cap. Important new group. You know, so there's some, there's some, uh, uh, it's important to keep up on that level, I think. I think visiting New York during that time is like your best shot. Yeah. Anyone else? Here's your chance. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, I'm a little worried about the, the white man play that will be coming out. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> It's going to be acted by a white man. Oh, great. I'll be in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I'm really curious about, uh, you mentioned, if you're at liberty, to discuss um, uh, the project that you were going to do with Los Lobos, if it was, if it's no longer going to happen, or, or what was it? Was it based on their music, a new new yeah, music? It was, or? it was a really cool project. Um, it's called Kiko and the Lavender. Oh. It's based on the album Kiko. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, Louis and I are good friends, Louis Perez and I are good friends, and you know, we just have never been able to swing it. You know, when I first got there in 95, we tried to do this um, project with Octavio Solis based on, um, uh, what is that Brazilian movie that we all love? That is, uh, no, that oh. takes place during Day of the Dead, and it's um, Black 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 Orpheus. Yes, Black Orpheus. Black Orpheus. Yes, Black Orpheus. It's Black Orpheus. We were trying to do a, a, a kind of Chicano version with Louis writing the the, 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 the music and Octavio writing the, the book, and that never happened. And then the next one was Kiko. The thing is that, you know, I understand uh, Louis wanted to work with, with somebody that he knew uh, to, to collaborate on the, on the book. However, you know, if the person, you know, there, there are only, it's a very um, um, disciplined and um, particular style. And if you don't know the form, it's hard to pull it off. And so I think we, we came into those kinds of challenges, you know, and then we tried to match him with someone and he just really wasn't interested in doing that. He wanted to, and I understand, he wanted to maintain control, he was afraid if he didn't know his collaborator, it would get out of control. Completely understand. So we were never really able to do it. And that really becomes the main issue. It's like a lot of people, um, they want to maintain control. And um, sometimes that's not possible. Uh, you know, you look at, um, what's the guy from um, American Idiot, what's the guy's name, the, the main... Billy uh, Joe Armstrong. Uh, Billy Joe Armstrong. He, you know, he found in Michael, um, what's, the guy, what's the director's <laughs> name? Oh my God. Michael, Michael Mayer? Mayer. Yeah. Mayer. He found a good collaborator and they wrote American Idiot. It's not the best book. But they were able to sort of work together, and so that was very, and look where that went. Um, and, and that's what you need to do, is either find a director who is really in the business that can really sell the work, or a writer who's really in it to be able, otherwise if you, it's you and some, you know, a community person or someone who's not a professional or doesn't have those kind of connections, it doesn't happen. So that's what happened. Okay. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. It's like if anybody would ask me, you know, I want to do a musical based on this, well, then I would say, who are your collaborators? Because if you don't have the right collaborators, it's not going to get anywhere. Yes? How important of a role does music play in, in stage or or acting stage or in opera. I know in opera, I can I can figure out the opera, but acting. How important of a role does it play to develop a character? To develop a like character. on stage, live right. on stage. Right. Um, you know, it really. I think. Well, there's a couple of answers to that. It depends on who the artists are. Some artists always have music, and there's musicality in their language, and there's musicality in the way that they move. 
Uh, however, if you're a playwright and you may be listening to music as you're writing your play, but when the actual uh, reading happens of your play and the production, uh, you know, that was only a, 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 a moment of inspiration and you don't really see it in the actual final product. Um, in, a, in, a, in a play that we might produce, music, we, uh, we uh, oftentimes hire composers and they do the transitional music or the underscore, and that's an important addition. Um, However, you know, we're doing, we're working on a new piece called Party People, which is based on the Black Panthers and the Young Lords. It's by this company called Universes. And they're, you know, they're spoken word artists and they, they write poetry and then they have a composer and they're doing music to it. And it's, it's all about music, you know, so it really depends on who the artist is and how much they integrate music into their work. Yeah, it really, it really does that because music is not always as integral to some artists as it is to others. Uh -huh. Yeah. So. I have one. Yeah. <laughs> so. Thank God. This is one of the best. This one. Um, so going back to Teatro Campesino, you toured the world, right? Yes. Teatro Campesino, and now you tour the world looking for new work yes. and, and, and talent. So like, what did that do for you, you think, being able to go outside of the yes. country and, and perform and Yes. I mean, how important has that been? Oh my God, it's been, it's been really, it's, it's really shaped me, you know. Uh, very young, I was already on the road, we were already touring Europe. We would stay there, you know, four to six months a year, uh, a month a, a year. I'd literally pack for winter and then send my clothes back and we'd have to buy clothes so that we could stay through the summer. I mean, it was that kind of life. And you'd go every other year. Um, and you, you know, you become a world citizen. And I think that's a lot of what happens to some of us as artists when we're not able to get out and see other people's work. Because what, what happens in some, when we would be in a small town like San Juan Bautista, we'd rehearse the work, but then, you know, you'd be working in, you know, in Madrid or you'd be performing in some castle in the middle of, uh, of Milano or you know some Greco-Roman theater in Sicily or in Germany or in, in, in some puppet theater in Sweden, <coughs> you were able to measure how good you were by other people by, by other people's theater and that it was world-class theater. I mean I, I saw you know Theatre du Soleil, we were on the same circuit and our work was compared to theirs. And so as a Chicano artist who was doing work in the 70s, the Teatro Campesino was world class. It was because it was an authentic experience. And though most of us, you know, I went to school in theater, my husband went to school in theater, but a lot of people didn't. But we trained so vigorously. Every day we were training. We were, you know, it was movement based. We were studying Mao at night, you know. We were, it was vigorous and rigorous. And, uh, you know, it's hard to, we were competitive, you know, uh, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, it puts, your, it puts you on a, on a, on a you know, a perspective where you're like, you got to measure up, you know, or else you don't have, a, you don't have a, a livelihood. And so I think that that was really, um, really, really cool. Also, you know, very young, um, I was still at UC Santa Barbara. And I would go in the summers to San Juan, you know, as an intern. And the last summer uh, of, of school, Peter Brook, you know, came to, to San Juan Bautista to, to do a residency. And um, that, was, that was, I think, a seminal uh, moment, you know, a seminal moment for all of us. I mean, I kind of knew who Peter Brook was, you know, but I was in the middle of going to school at UC Santa Barbara as a theater major. I knew who he was and studied him, but I didn't really know who he was, you know. <laughs> and then he brings all these, like, really weird-looking hippie people, you know, to San Juan. And they were all, and they had just been in Africa, the Center for uh, International Theater Research. And they were all with these, the girls and ladies were with these, like, garbs, like, long, white, you know, that wrap the scarves, like this. And, and they were all, like, amazing actors, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, literally, he, we had this warehouse that had no air conditioning. It was in the summer. And they put this carpet down, like a huge carpet, you know, on there. And that's all we had in the warehouse. 
And, uh, you know, we'd be in a circle, and Peter would say, you know, when you go out in a circle, die. You have to die. <laughs> What the hell is he talking about? <laughs> and you're like, you realize that what he's saying is you leave your ego behind, right? And you just go out there and, and you're in the moment, you know? And these uh, amazing performers were great improvisers. Uh, and uh, we were working on a show called Conference of the Birds, which is based on a Sufi myth uh, that these, uh, you know, uh, moths, you know, the thing that as soon as the moth gets by the flame, they, you know, disappear. And uh, so uh, we spent the summer learning how to be birds, right? And um, in, the, in the, I mean, there was amazing actors, but still some actors that still work with Peter today, they're much older. They were, they, they, these actors were in, really in their 30s when we worked with them. Most of us were in our early 20s. I was still in my late teens. And, uh, and, um, uh, Bruce Myers, who still works with Peter, Yoshi Oida, who is a master, you know, an actor. They still work with Peter. And Helen Mirren was in that company. She was probably around 27 or 28. And uh, they had bought a house uh, for us to live in. And uh, it was empty and they had a few beds and everything. And uh, so, my, so Helen and I were roommates. <laughs> and. Uh, so we spent the summer of, uh, you know, 1973 uh, living in this house in a living room on uh, mattresses we slept on. And uh, so she, uh, and she was really fun. She took me under her wing. And uh, she wanted, uh, you know, she's in America. So she wanted to buy a, a, a convertible <laughs> and a red one. So, she, so I, I tell my dad, you know, who had bought me a green Le Mans with this white vinyl top that I drove around. So my father was totally into cars, and you know, he, he, he goes to San Jose, we go to San Jose, he finds Helen a red convertible, and we drive the whole summer in that damn car. It was so fun. But uh, that was an actress at that very early age who would just go on a, out on that carpet and just uh, you know, be in the moment. She was amazing. She was really amazing. But not but equally as amazing was Luis Valdez's sister, Socorro Valdez, who I've never, ever, ever in my whole life seen another actress be as good. I mean, Helen was really good, but Socorro, because maybe she just knew our reality and could play men better than men and could, 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 could do back flips and forward flips and land and cry at the same time. That, she was an amazing performer and I always, oh, I always aspired to be like her. She was amazing. I, I, I've, you know, I've, I've never been as good as her. And she ended up leaving. She, she burned out. She just wasn't interested in having a career. And she became a minister. Wow. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, I think that's very interesting. So those two women, uh, very different, you know, one very dark, one very light, uh, really were my, my, my measurements of what... Who was the dark one? Well, uh, uh, Socorro was dark and, and Helen was very light. <laughs> and, I, and, I've been, and they've been my measurements all these years. I love that. That's a one-woman show. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, you know, uh, it has never veered from that. And that was, that was so, so long ago. I've never, I've never been in the room with two great talents like that. Yeah. And how, how about, like, for, you've had such an amazing career, like, is there something you feel you haven't done yet or you want to do that maybe one day? You know, I, I wish I had known the importance of being a writer. I wish I had known that earlier. Um, and, you know, I was busy doing things, but I think that writing is where it's at. Um, I think that that's where your legacy can be. It lasts longer than you. Um, we don't have enough of them. Um, it's so cool to, to really, really be good at it, you know. Uh, we have so many stories uh, that we need to tell. Uh, and there's not enough of us telling them, you know. Um, I wish it were, you know. Um, and wow, man, we're, we're, we're a huge part of this American population. 
and where there's just not enough of us telling these stories, you know. So I think that that's the one thing that I would have started writing earlier. I think, but you know, I don't think I was ready, and I don't think I was good enough, you know, at, at this point. I mean, I've started to write. I'm on my third play. Uh, my first one's getting done, and my second one, nobody's interested yet, and my third, I think, is interesting, you know. Um, so, yeah, being a writer. Being a writer. Yeah, that, w that would have been something that I might have thought of. If I had realized the importance of it a little earlier, I think I would have focused a little bit more on it. Yeah. I don't know where my acting is going, you know. I'm older now. I haven't been on stage since 2007. I don't think I have the same muscles as I did before in terms of concentration. I think I'm too much a director and mm -hmm. I don't have the, the singular focus it takes to be an actor. I mean, I think I could still do it. I think I'd still be good, but I, you know, that I would need a little practice. <laughs> <laughs> but I think one of the things I do miss is because I was a, a comedian. I miss the laughter. I miss holding for the jokes. I miss the wave of laughter. I, I miss holding for it longer. I miss working it. You know, like all of that. I miss. I miss. I miss because you know, I really, I was, I have a really great technique, and you know, I, you know, I was a very good comedic actress. You know, yeah. And I mean, I, I worked hard to, to be it. You know, I mean, I worked a long time. So, yeah. Hmm. So what advice do you have for the writers? We have writers in the room, and you know, there's always a frustration of like, oh, I have five plays and nobody's producing them. Right. You know, um, and then we have young writers and solo writers right. and what have you. I mean, what advice? Of you know, maybe maybe it's a little bit. They did this thing. I can't remember what it, it's actually the name of it. It was called something Elsie through thirteen or something. And uh, Maria Goyanes from the public. She's an associate producer. She produced these thirteen writers over I don't know six years or four years, and they all got together and they produced their own work. P thirteen. P thirteen is yeah, that it was playwright. Right, P thirteen, and they produced their own work. And I think really that's a ticket. It's like, when I think about Young Jean Lee, nobody would produce her work. <laughs> nobody would get it. She did it herself. And to me, that's the real ticket. It's like, well, it, you know, if you can't do it yourself, then maybe four of you can do it together. You know what I'm saying? I think the key, when we did Latin's Anonymous, and, and that really, I think Latin's Anonymous gave me that extra push to have a, you know, to have a bigger career was that we, four of us got together and we put in our little money and we produced our own show and then we made box office and then that money we took and we invested in other money and then we, we had other collaborators and that pushed us forward. So I think those collaborations with other artists uh, is a real, is a real, don't, you know, people aren't going to get the work necessarily right off. You know, I think maybe my work is a little bit too middle class for theaters. They want really more struggle. They want a little bit more edge. They want a little bit more whatever. They're not interested in the struggle of the Chicano middle class. That's not interesting. <laughs> <laughs> right? Really? You know, they don't even believe that a middle, Latino like, middle class exists, you know, let alone that you're in struggle over how powerful you are or whatever. Obama huh? Obama. I think Obama knows. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I think that that would probably be my biggest piece of advice. I mean, you know, you 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 know, you have this space here. You have Jesus who knows how to produce. <laughs> Not that I'm giving you a job, but <laughs> what? But you can advise. Um, you know. I think it's important because there's the 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 big brass ring is the regional theater, but then there are all these other opportunities. So it's like, you know, that advice that we need to. It's like. How, if you want the regional theater, what do you have to do versus... Yeah, yeah. Do you, you, you have to, I, I believe that there's got to be a little bit of doing yourself. It really, really has. Invest in yourself, you know, it's your business. You're, you're a writer, it's your business, you do it. And, and you don't necessarily need to do it alone. You know, you get like-minded people who are interested in producing their work as well as yours, and you, you know, collaborate, you know. They'll find you, right? And, and they'll find you. Right? You know, also, the thing is, you know, I work with this writing group, and that's really how I started writing plays, is that there's this amazing group of people. They asked me to be in their group when it first started. They're all better writers than I am. I'm, a, I'm, not, I'm definitely not 
the best writer in it. We have people that are showrunners of the TV and they also write plays and, you know, they're yeah, amazing, amazing writers on major, you know, television series. And, uh, and, and also been produced everywhere. And wow, working with people that are better than me is the ticket. Don't be afraid of that. You know, write, work, work with writers that are better than you or, or, or actors who are better than you. That is also the ticket. You know, don't be afraid of that. In fact, that's a really good thing for you. You know, challenge yourself. Don't be afraid. You know, if you think you're good, you're not going to lose yourself in that at all. You know, and I think that's what makes you excellent. Also, I really think you have to listen. You have to be humble enough to listen. Take it in. Not, you don't need to listen to everybody. You just, <laughs> listen to, you just listen to people that you trust. And listen, and take it in, and think about it, and ask someone else you trust. And if they say the same thing, then maybe the, you know, there's something in that. And responding to what people are telling you in your work is very, very important, you know. Um, and that's both as an act, as any kind of artist, you know. Listen to people. I think that's really also the real key. And I've done a lot of that. I've done a lot of listening. Yeah. Thank you. When you speak about um, how failure is important, um, could you speak of a, a, a pivotal failure that, you know, because usually you fail and you're just like oh, moving on, but a failure that really you thought about and you took it away of what needed to be learned to move on and to be better? Well, let me see. What was a big failure? <laughs> one that you would like to share if you've never failed, I understand. <laughs> shows in San Juan and uh, we wouldn't finish them and we had touring gigs <laughs> and we wouldn't have an end. We wouldn't have an end and we would have to go and, and improvise the end. It was like a nightmare. <gasps> oh yeah, it was a nightmare. It was horrible. <laughs> I still remember those well. Um, and it, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't so much a it was a little bit more of a group failure mm -hmm. because we would either start too late or uh, <coughs> uh, we didn't have enough infrastructure to really finish it or um, we didn't really know what we were trying to say because you know a lot of this work was collective creation right and Luis we would improvise and Luis would would script it but you know there we'd run out of time and uh, I, there were many times when I thought, oh my God, I never want to be in that position again. It's such a nightmare to go and not know how you're going to end your play. <laughs> and there's people staring at you when they paid a price and a ticket. I mean, that's a nightmare. So I always thought, oh my God, I never want to be in that situation again. And I would work towards, we got to start earlier, guys. Or, you know, how can we plan better? Or, you know, what are we really trying to say way earlier, way earlier than now? Um, there's another thing about, um, you know, um, staying, having, maintaining good relationships throughout your career. That's a real tough one. Um, and I've learned that I, I, I have to do that because the, com the community is very, very small. And I had a very tough situation where I, uh, I don't believe it was my fault, but you know, there was some uh, misunderstanding. And every time I would see this individual at a, you know, an event or whatever, I'd have to pretend I, you know, I didn't recognize him or I didn't see him or he would do the same. It was ridiculous, you know. I didn't want to live my life trying to avoid someone that's in the same field as me and over all these years, you know, that's not something I want to do. I believe that, you know, I really, even if you're never going to be good friends with them, 
be cordial. You know what I'm saying? Have a because it's going to come around to you, and and they're going to be in your space, and you may need them one day, or they may need you, or you just need them to be cool with you while you do your thing, and they don't stop. You know, like, and I, that's a big lesson for me. It's like I. My agent finally told me, you need to talk to this person, you need to be bigger than them, you need to make amends and end it because it's getting in the way. And so I think that was a really good lesson for me. You know, I don't know if it was a failure, but it was a failure in communication, I think. And I think that that's a really, I think I would say that to all of you guys, try to maintain good relationships with everyone in the field. Again, you don't have to be their best friend. Uh, but um, you know, try try to yeah. You don't have to be their first friend, but, but don't have that happen because it'll it'll get back. You know, it'll it'll get back. And you always know when when you know you know the people that you trust, and you know you can be candid with those people. And others, you know, if you don't know them well, you say nothing. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hector, did you take any jobs outside of the theater or outside of the arts? I have one job. Outside of the theater, and that was um, and that was uh, the summer of I don't know 1985 or something. When we first came to LA, and my friend Olga Bettis, um, I needed a little summer job, and she says, "Come and work at the Golandrina on Olga Bettis Street." <laughs> and it's like, okay, because her friend uh, owned it, owns the Golandrina. And so I went, I worked for a summer, and I had the, the whole Mexican thing. I loved it. <laughs> it was so fun. Because I love the busboys, they were hilarious. You know, I'd split the tips with them, and then, you know, you'd be up on top and eating, and then you'd be drinking after work. It was too fun. I ended up staying till almost Thanksgiving. It was almost supposed to be a summer job, and I had to force myself to quit. Because I had such a good time. I made tons of tips. It was like entertaining. I loved it. That was the only straight job I've ever had. Yeah. I loved it. Uh, what's your writing process like? You, you travel a lot. I uh, and you're really busy, but like, where do you find the time, or how do you I, make I, the time? I don't sleep. Yeah. <laughs> no, I re I literally I get up at like you know four. Yeah. And I'll write. Uh, and sometimes um, I wake up. Yeah, you know, I wake up thinking, oh, I I, I have an idea, and I'll, I'll do it. It'll be early in the morning, mm -hmm. or it'll be at, at the office in the middle of all that chaos. I, I, can, I have the ability, you know, I can, I can concentrate. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, I mean, a lot of, some of you know, but you know, I have a, I have a, I'm a, I'm, what's it called? I am a freelance writer for Mattel, the Mattel Toy Company. And I've been a freelance writer for Mattel since 2008. And I write all the Barbie live musicals that go on the road internationally. And so um, I do them. My, my next gig, is, it goes to Singapore. It's rehearsed. You guys are all going to be able to come because it's the first time ever that any of these shows have been rehearsed in LA. It's going to be rehearsed in LA. It's going to be built in LA. It's going to be teched in LA. And then at the end of the rehearsal in July, early July, mm -hmm. they're putting it all in a container and it goes to Singapore and it tours Asia for eight months. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all out, full Broadway shows. 24 people, and it's all about Barbie. <laughs> and I Barbie? Wow. No, it is not Asian Barbie. It's regular Barbie. It's all in English. And, and it's the story of Barbie, and I made it this up. Story, uh, story of Barbie, and she's making a movie because Barbie, you know, is an actress. <laughs> what? Barbie's an actress, and she and her best friend Teresa are making a movie. And Teresa is her first movie, and she's all insecure. And there's this actress who really wants her part and makes her even more insecure. So this whole story is about Barbie trying to convince her best friend Teresa to stay on the job and that she can do it, right? And that, that she's going to support her and that's what girls do and they support each other. So the whole thing is about girl power and how to support each other and how to be very best friends and how to feel and be empowered, right? And Barbie is actually when they, it was a ridiculous it's, it's so random that I do these things. <laughs> and honestly, the way I got it was there was this intern who was a Latino Chicano who worked in the press department. 
fabulous guy. And he was really cool and he remembered me and he uh, became the boyfriend, the partner of the producer at Mattel. And when they were looking for a writer director, he remembered me and he mentioned it to Michael Cooper. And so then I just went through this interview process and then I got it and, and I've been writing for them since 2008. And I, the, my first show with them premiered in Buenos Aires. I hey, went down. <laughs> I went down. It was so fun. It was amazing. You know, and it's been, to, you know, it's really, it's had, it, it toured all over Latin America. And so it's been very fun. But um, that, that process is, is generally, I'll, I'll do it very early in the morning. Yeah. And then, or like today, I wrote a little rewrite at, at the theater very mm. quickly so I could get it off. Yeah. So. Yeah, you manage. Wherever. Yeah. <laughs> I think oh, if anyone has a, one more burning question, something they have to get off your chest. No, <laughs> <laughs> huh? no burning question. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but um, thank you, Diane. So from the crop fields to Barbie and Argentina, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's a career. Ah, right? yeah. 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 Thank you, thank you, Dan. Being That's fine. Thank you, guys. Um, so find your uh, friends, Cindy Marie Jenkins dot com, and uh, it'll be in our channel this is, right? Yeah, yeah. I'll try loading that tomorrow. We'll see. Okay. Uh, <laughs> YouTube, YouTube, YouTube channel, and we'll have we're trying to have one of these at least a month. So um, so keep on coming. And office hours every Wednesday. So you're all welcome to come. That's great. Thank you very much. What is there in the library? Six. 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 Six.